Thank you.
Center. We are so excited that you're here tonight for a very, very special program. My name is Stephanie Street and I serve as the Executive Director of the Clinton Foundation and behalf of all of our staff uh, and volunteers from the Clinton Foundation, the Clinton Library and the Clinton School of Public Service, let me again just say uh, a special thank you and a welcome to you. This is going to be really an extraordinary program we've been looking forward to for a long time. And please allow me to ex uh, extend a special thank you to our members and our donors uh, whose financial support 
support makes programs like this possible. Please uh, join me in giving them a hand. So tonight, we are going to embark on a journey way back in time. And our guide is a world-renowned professor, paleontologist, and best-selling author, Dr. Steve Brusati. Dr. Brusati is the author of the, uh, of the international bestseller, The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs. Um, and he served as the paleontology, paleontology advisor on the Jurassic World film franchise. He has named more than 15 new species of dinosaurs and several ancient mammals. And his research and his writing has been featured in Science, The New York Times, Scientific American, and many more publications. And this probably comes as no surprise to, uh, to you all tonight, but President Clinton is a huge fan. And in fact, he is the one that suggested that we reach out to Dr. Brusati and invite him to speak tonight at the Clinton Center. And I'm sure you'll hear more about that story of, of that famous tweet uh, in just a few moments. Uh, so tonight's program, as you know, is being held in conjunction with our temporary exhibition, Dinosaur Explorer, which is an interactive, family-friendly exhibit that invites visitors on an unforgettable adventure and will leave them with a new understanding of the most fascinating living organisms in known history. Now, the exhibit is going to close on October 1st, so be sure to catch it uh, before it becomes extinct and make sure you tell all of your friends and neighbors uh, about it too. Tonight, Dr. Brusati will discuss where dinosaurs came from, how they rose to dominance, why and when most dinosaurs became extinct, and where we can still see living dinosaur uh, descendants today. Additionally, he'll share some stories about he and his students excavate fossils and bones and show how scientists use modern technologies to study old fossils. And after the program, Dr. Brusati will sign copies of his bestseller, The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs, which uh, copies are available uh, for purchase here on site by the Clinton Museum Store. Now, a few little housekeeping uh, items, just please silence your cell phones. Um, and I also want to recognize a few other uh, special guests before we get started tonight. Uh, as you all know, uh, here in Arkansas, August is back to school month. And so prior to this program, we held our annual educators reception. And I believe some of our esteemed guests are still uh, stayed over for this program. So if you are one of our uh, Educators, uh, please stand up and let us recognize and thank you for your extraordinary service. Please know here at the Clinton Center, we strive every day to serve as an extension of your classroom and know how much we value and trust and appreciate all you do for our children and for our community. So without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Steve Brusati to the stage. All right, well, thank you all for coming out. I've, you know, I've done a lot of dinosaur stuff in my life. I didn't know dinosaurs at a presidential library museum, but here we are. I know the president is a big dinosaur enthusiast, mostly because of his grandchildren. Uh, so it's a, really a wonderful thing to have this exhibit, and I really appreciate the invitation. Uh, and what I'm gonna do here, in a little bit of a rapid fire uh, format, is I'm gonna tell you the story of dinosaurs. And I'm gonna try to tell you the story of the whole 150 million plus years of evolution of the dinosaurs in about 45 minutes. So <laughs> I won't blather on too much, but I'll just say uh, I teach at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, and I've been there about a decade, but I grew up in Illinois, and uh, I've been visiting my family this summer, and, and uh, actually when we arrived, uh, a few days after that is when I got this invitation from the president to come here. So we made it work. I'm very happy to, to do it. I drove down from Champaign, Illinois today, uh, and uh, uh, I'm just, again, really pleased to have this opportunity. Um, it's great to teach and to work in Scotland at the University of Edinburgh. And for some of you, uh, you know, younger members of the audience here, I've already met a few of you, uh, both of the Jacks uh, so far, and a few others. Um, 
we got a great paleontology program, so this whole thing will be a little bit of an advertisement for what we do, but please do keep us in, in mind, you know, if any of you want to study paleontology, because this university at Edinburgh, the university goes back to the 1580s, and it's the place where geology as a science started, and some of the world's greatest fossils have been found in Scotland, including some dinosaurs, which I'll tell you about in a little bit. So I feel just a really special, you know, feeling to be able to grow up in the middle of America, make my way to Scotland, and be able to have this life studying dinosaurs. And I'll give you a little snippet uh, of that. Okay, so um, the talk will more or less follow the story I tell in the book, which um, we'll, we'll be uh, signing out there afterwards. Mm -hmm. And anybody who wants a signed copy, I'll wait until the last one is signed. Anybody who has any questions, I'm happy to chat, of course, when we're doing the books. Uh, but I published the, the book a few years ago. It was genuinely one of the biggest shocks of my life, <laughs> but also one of the proudest moments of my life when somebody on, I guess, the social media platform formerly known as Twitter uh, <laughs> sent me a message one time in, in October of 2019 saying, Bill Clinton said something about your book. And I said, okay, what's that? This must be a, a hoax. And he posted a video to this thing where the president was at a summit and he was asked his favorite book that he's read over the year. And he said, the book about dinosaurs. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, I, I, I was just so honored. And, and that started the connection here with the, the, the Clinton Center. So. Um, uh, so, uh, just uh, again, a big thanks to all of you who put this talk together. I've met so many of you today, all the volunteers here as well. Thank you for making this happen. Okay, that's enough. Enough waffling. I want to tell you about dinosaurs. Again, it's 150 million years, more actually, of evolution I want to cover in 45 minutes. And I want to tell you where dinosaurs came from. I want to tell you how they rose up to dominance, how they grew to huge sizes and ruled the world and how some of them uh, sprouted feathers and wings and became the birds of today. And then I want to tell you about how the rest of them died out very rapidly in this extinction event, I think, that does hold a lot of relevance for us today. And so to start telling this story, we have to go back actually about 250 million years to when the world looked like this. This was the time of the supercontinent of Pangaea, when all of the land was gathered together into this one enormous landmass that stretched from North Pole to South Pole. And this was a really difficult, challenging place to call home. This world of the supercontinent was hot, it was dry, there were vast deserts across much of that land. But of course, organisms adapt, organisms always adapt. And there were different plants and animals that were really well suited to that desert supercontinent world, including some of our earliest mammal ancestors. They ruled that world. But then, catastrophe hit about 200 and 50 million years ago. These enormous volcanoes started to erupt in what is now Siberia, in Russia. And it's always Russia. <laughs> 250 million years ago, now. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> but these volcanoes, these were unlike anything humans have ever seen, okay? Don't think the Hawaiian volcanoes, Mount St. Helens, Pinatubo, get those out of your mind. These were volcanoes, mega volcanoes. They were essentially like Grand Canyon size fissures in the earth that opened up and spewed out tsunamis of lava for hundreds of thousands of years. And that lava covered a lot of land. It scorched a lot of the land. But the real problem was as that magma came up, it burnt through the earth before it erupted as lava, and that released a lot of carbon dioxide and methane, all these nasty greenhouse gases. And that caused runaway global warming, and that led to a mass extinction. And this was the closest that life has ever come to dying out ever since the first living things evolved about four billion years ago. Maybe 95% of all species died in the inferno and the global warming of those volcanoes, but a few things did survive. And when I was a student, I was particularly interested in this extinction. I wanted to know what lived and what died and how a new world was forged in the aftermath of this. And so I spent a lot of time in Poland looking for fossils. And maybe Poland doesn't strike you as the kind of place where you would go, would go and dig up 
dinosaurs and big fossils. It maybe doesn't fit that image you see on the Discovery Channel shows or National Geographic shows of you know some br brawny guy that looks like Indiana Jones going out in the desert and brushing the sand off of the bones. That is not what most paleontology or archaeology is like. And really, we can find fossils anywhere where, there, where there's the right type of rocks because fossils are the remains of ancient things that are preserved and turned into rock. They're encased in rock. So Poland happens to have a lot of rocks from the time before that extinction and then the time after that extinction, which is called the Triassic period. And these rocks, you often find them in quarries where they mine them to get clay to make bricks. And you can read those rocks layer by layer like the pages in a book. And you can see the fossils in those rocks. And that tells the story of what died and what lived in that extinction and how a new world was forged afterwards. Now, the fossils we find in Poland, most of them are not big skeletons. They're not the kind of things you would see at the centerpiece of a museum exhibit. But they're a more humble type of fossil. They're what we call trace fossils. They're basically the marks that these animals left behind as they were going about their everyday lives. Handprints, footprints, drag marks from their tails, that kind of stuff. And in rocks that are only about one million years after that, those volcanoes, we start to see these tracks. This is a footprint and a handprint. And they're really small. You can see they're just a, a, about an inch long or so. So they're, they're roughly about the size of a, a, your cat's paw print. And they were made by animals that would have looked something like this. And we can tell this because we can do the Cinderella thing and see which skeletons can fit the footprints. Now, what you're looking at here is a small animal, again, about the size of a house cat, kind of an awkward looking creature, I think. I think it looks kind of weird, frankly. <laughs> Very long, gangly, spindly arms and legs, really slim body. But you can tell by the look of this thing that it was a fast runner. It was agile. It was energetic. This thing is a reptile. It's a type of reptile that had ancestors that survived those volcanoes. And this is a type of reptile we call a dinosauromorph. And that's just a fancy scientific name. And apologies, I don't know how you sign dinosauromorph. <laughs> but uh, that's just the name for the very closest cousins of dinosaurs. Essentially, this is like the Lucy. You know, Lucy is this fossil of a human ancestor, a very close relative of humans. This is like the dinosaur version of Lucy. And what you're looking at here is what the ancestor of dinosaurs would have looked like. And I know this doesn't look like a T-Rex or a Brontosaurus. It's not some big, enormous, scary dinosaur. But, of course, all great things have to start somewhere. And this is where dinosaurs got their start. These humble little reptiles the size of cats trying to eke out and existence in the aftermath of those terrible volcanoes. Now, these first dinosaurs and their close cousins, they were not dominant animals. They were not at the top of the food chain. They were not very special, frankly. They were just one of many groups of animals trying to survive during that chaotic time. And as the Triassic period unfolded for the next 50 million years, these dinosaurs evolved, they changed, they gave rise to new species, but they were not dominant. They were not at the top of the food chain. It was other animals that really ruled the Triassic world, and we've got a glimpse of some of these in Portugal. We've done a lot of field work in Portugal, and we've found a graveyard of hundreds of skeletons. And when we found the first bones, we were hoping, oh, maybe they're dinosaurs. But no, the dinosaurs were so small and so rare, it's hard to find their fossils in Portugal. But instead, these hundreds of skeletons are from these types of animals. Hideous, slimy, grotesque animal. They kind of make my skin crawl. I shouldn't say that as a scientist. These are amphibians. They're basically salamanders, and they were the size of cars. And these were the animals that ruled the rivers and the lakes back during the time when the first dinosaurs were small and humble. But things weren't any better on dry land because the Triassic period, this was the age of the crocodiles. Now today, we know crocodiles and alligators, they're plenty scary. You don't want to run into one. There's all kinds of horror stories of people, mostly down in Florida, running into a gator, doing something stupid. Doesn't usually end well. Uh, but really, frankly, I mean, alligators, crocodiles are not that important today. 
There's none of them back home where I'm from. They really only live in the tropics or the subtropics. There's only about 25 species of them. But back in the Triassic period, there were thousands of crocs, and a lot of them lived on the land, and some of them were almost the size of buses. Other ones were top predators. Some had spikes all over their bodies. Some had armor. Some had sails on their backs. Some lost all their teeth and had beaks like turtles. Some walked only on their hind legs, if you can imagine a croc walking on its hind legs. This was the age of crocodiles, and it was these crocodiles that ruled the land when the first dinosaurs were trying to find their way. And that's what it was like for the first 50 million years of the history of dinosaurs and their close cousins. Dinosaurs didn't really get much bigger than horses. Maybe a few got up to the size of a giraffe. They were second-tier animals, role players in that Triassic world where the supercontinent was still in existence. But then something happened. Of course something happened. And about 200 million years ago, as the Triassic period ended, the supercontinent began to split apart. And of course it did. That's why we have separate continents today. And today, the ocean fills the gaps you know, between the different continents. You can see that South America and Africa fit together like puzzle pieces. That's because they used to be connected. And then the continent split apart, and the Atlantic Ocean came in to fill the gaps. But before the water came in to fill those gaps, once again the Earth bled lava. And once again there was massive global warming, and there was another big extinction. Not quite as bad as that one 50 million years earlier, but still a pretty nasty one. And for any of you that uh, maybe have been to New York City, you look across the Hudson River over to New Jersey, there's a big, thick cliff of rock. It's called the Palisades. That rock is the remnants of the magma from that very moment that the supercontinent was splitting. And in fact, there's these magma rocks, these, these rocks that solidified from the magma, magma all along the Atlantic seaboard. And so, the supercontinent broke apart. There was a big extinction again. That extinction decimated the giant salamanders. It decimated the crocs, leaving only a few species, the ancestors of today's crocodiles and alligators. But the dinosaurs were the great survivors of that extinction. And we don't know why. <laughs> I wish I could tell you why. It would make the story a whole lot more convincing. But the fact is we don't know why. We know that it happened. We know that this extinction basically wiped out the dinosaurs' competitors. It spared the dinosaurs. But we don't know why that is. And there's all kinds of theories. Maybe the dinosaurs were warm-blooded. Maybe they grew fast. Maybe they had feathers to keep them warm and keep their body temperature regular during all these swings in climate. Maybe they could run faster. Maybe they were smarter than the other animals. All kinds of theories. We don't know. And I really do think this is one of the biggest mysteries that remains about dinosaurs. And there's plenty of mysteries. There's still so much we don't know about dinosaurs. And I, I do think that this one will be solved by somebody in the next generation of paleontologists, maybe Jack here. Who knows? Maybe somebody else in the room. It's a big mystery. Somebody needs to solve it. <laughs> we don't know the answer, but what we do know is that as the Triassic period ended, the supercontinent broke apart, the next interval of time began, this is what we call the Jurassic period, and this is the age that dinosaurs became dominant. This was the age where dinosaurs evolved their grandeur. They spread around the world. They grew to huge sizes. They became the top predators, the biggest plant eaters in most ecosystems on land. And all these familiar species, the ones with long necks and horns and spikes and frills and duck bills and dome heads and all of those fantastic sublime things we think of when we think of dinosaurs. All the quirky, amazing features you can see on these dinosaurs in the exhibit here. This is in the Jurassic period when dinosaurs evolved these things. And there's a reason that is called Jurassic Park. <laughs> Not Triassic Park. Triassic Park would be a book and a film about car-sized salamanders and crocs that walk on their hind legs. I think a pretty cool film. It probably wouldn't make a billion dollars at the global box office. Uh, but the Jurassic, that's when the dinosaurs we all know and love started to spread around. And right now, we are finding more dinosaurs than ever before. We really are in the golden age of paleontology. And somewhere around the world, somebody is discovering a new species of dinosaur on average once every single week. So that's about 50 new species that are found every year. And I mean a new species, not a new bone, not a new skeleton, not just another T-Rex, 
but a totally new species. And this has been going on for over a decade. So since the time I became a paleontologist, there have been like well over like a thousand dinosaurs that have been found. It's amazing. And, we're fi and this is really because there's so many more people looking for dinosaurs than ever before. And like so many fields of research, paleontology used to be a very narrow, very esoteric field. In some ways, it still is. Uh, but it used to be something that if you wanted to be a paleontologist, you pretty much had to study or work at, you know, some of the posh universities in the U.S. and Canada and Western Europe. That was pretty much it. But now there's people all over the world, young boys, young girls. That didn't used to be such a thing. But going out all over the place, studying dinosaurs, finding their own dinosaurs. And I have colleagues in China, Brazil, Argentina, South Africa, Mongolia that grew up with Jurassic Park, and that's really what sparked a lot of this. And so people are now finding dinosaurs all over the world, and people are finding dinosaurs in so many interesting places that we're even finding them in Scotland, believe it or not, <laughs> and believe it. But it's a weird thing because... The very first dinosaur fossil in Scotland was discovered right around the time I was born. And that was in the mid 80s. And it was only then, I mean, people have been finding dinosaurs in America for much, much, much longer. People never even knew there were dinosaurs in Scotland, but now we keep finding a lot of new ones. And these are important dinosaurs because they are Jurassic age dinosaurs and they help tell us how dinosaurs spread around the world and grew to big sizes and became dominant. And these Scottish dinosaurs are about 170 million years old, and most of them come from one place, an enchanted place, a place I think is one of the most beautiful places in the world, a place where they've started to film a lot of big Hollywood movies because of the gorgeousness of the scenery. And this is a little island off the west coast of Scotland. It's called the Isle of Skye, and maybe some of you have been there. Uh, maybe some of you have tried the really nice whiskey they make there. It's called Talisker. They have it down in the 42 bar I saw. How about that? Um, I'm always trying to get them to sponsor our digs, but it hasn't happened. But it's a wonderful place, Sky. Beautiful place. Um, very popular with tourists now. And I mean, just look at those landscapes. But those landscapes are carved, some of them are carved out of Jurassic Age rocks that are full of fossils. And so, we go, we look, every year we go out and I bring my students out there and I teach my students how to search for fossils and dig up dinosaurs and it's a challenging place to work. The weather, let's say, is about the complete opposite of like today's Arkansas weather. Um, you know, it's cold, it's wet, it's always damp, it's windy, um, it's Scotland. And, uh, and almost all the fossils are found along the coast, so we're always battling the tides. And so you can see, th this is May. Okay, and I, I grew up in Illinois, right? I mean, I'm from the Chicago area. Like, I know what cold is. This is a different kind of cold. But it's worth it because we find some amazing fossils there. And it's no exaggeration, and I, I mean this completely, that my students always find the best fossils. More reason for maybe some of you to come and study with us in Edinburgh if you get the chance. And I, w I wish I could say that I find the best fossils because it's always a little bit of a competition when we're out there looking for fossils, you know. Uh, but it's always my students find the best fossils. And there's no better example than this is Amelia in the middle there. She was a student a few years back. She was out with us walking along the coastline. She noticed something sticking out of the rock. It was a bit darker than the rest of the rock. It had a bit of a different texture to it. That's how she realized it was a fossil. She called us over, and I looked at it, and I said, oh, my God, this is the head of a pterodactyl. <laughs> it was the entire head of one of these pterosaur reptiles that flew over the heads of dinosaurs. And it had a wingspan of over eight feet wide. It had a wingspan wider than a king-size bed. And we named it last year as a new species. We called it Yarkskianok. It's a Gallic name. That's from the, the language that actually many people still speak up in the Scottish Highlands. Anyway, I could say a lot more about it, except as the younger uh, crowd knows, I mean, Jack will know this for sure. Pterodactyls, are they dinosaurs? Nope. <laughs> so I'd have to, yeah, I would just be straying too much if I said more about pterosaurs. So that's a trivia thing for uh, maybe some of the older crowd here. If you're ever in a, in, a, in a quiz or something, pterodactyls are not dinosaurs. They're dinosaur cousins. But we find them, and we find mammals, and we find frogs and salamanders and all kinds of things on the Isle of Skye. We find the fossils from the whole ecosystem. But we're mostly interested in the dinosaurs. And again, the students find the best fossils. And we have students that come from all over the world to study with us. This is Moji, who came from, uh, from Nigeria to do our master's course. 
And she was actually studying the fossil fish. So she's using this little tool, this angle grinder, to cut the, the fish bones out of the rock because the rock is really hard. It's harder than concrete. But if we want dinosaurs, well, we got to use bigger tools. <laughs> and so we, we have to use diamond tip saws to cut the bones out of the rock, literally. And this is Doogie Ross, who we work with on the island. He grew up on the island. He speaks Gaelic as his native language. And he's the only guy I know who has literally built his own museum. He started collecting fossils and artifacts when he was a teenager. He needed a place to put them. He found the ruins of a one-room schoolhouse from the 19th century. He built it into a museum. And that note means he has a lot of saws. He knows how to use them. <laughs> so he helps us cut the bones out of the rock. Anyway, I could go on and on about Sky, but I want to tell you one story of one discovery that puts into context why these fossils are important. And this is a find that we made a few years back at the far northern tip of the island. And I'm taking this picture. Um, I'm literally standing in the shadow of the ruins of a 14th century castle. It doesn't get much more Scottish than that. And look at that sky on the Isle of Skye. Those of you with good eyesight can tell that's a blue sky. <laughs> There's no rain. <laughs> so why in the world am I taking a photo? Why am I up on the hill? To, why am I not looking for fossils? Well, the problem is it's high tide, and the waves are lapping against the beach. But when the tide goes down, that beach turns into a rock platform. It juts out about 300 feet into the very frigid waters of the North Atlantic. And we visited there a few years back, hoping to find some fossils. And we looked all day literally on our hands and knees, looking for dinosaur bones, dinosaur teeth, we found nothing. And it was a very frustrating day. And the reality is that a lot of days are like that when you go out looking for fossils. Because, you know, if it was, if it was easy, if you found a dinosaur every time you went out, everybody would be finding dinosaurs every day. You know, it, it, there is a challenge. It's like gold prospecting or, or looking for diamonds. You know, there is this, this, this element of patience and luck that goes into it. And this was just uh, one of those days that just luck wasn't on our side. So about 7 o'clock at night or so, we start to walk back to our vehicles. We start to look at these tide pools. And these are just, you know, the normal tide pools from the Scottish coast. Seaweed and barnacles and limpets and hermit crabs and all that kind of stuff. But we started to notice that actually there were a lot of tide pools on this rock platform. There were over 100 of them, actually. And they were all about the same size and shape. Each one was about the size of a car tire. And then we started to notice that these things actually had a pattern to them. There was a bit of a zigzagging, like left-right pattern to them, which you can see here, a bit of a left-right pattern. That's weird. You wouldn't expect that if this was just random holes made by the tide. And then some of these things we could see from the side. We could see they were actually impressed into the rock. So these things were formed by something that was impressing into the soft sand before it hardened into rock. Now, some of these holes were filled with another type of rock that really stood out and helped us see the shape of these holes. They're not actually holes. They had little bits sticking out. One, two, three, four, there. Some of them were paired together. There was a bigger horseshoe-shaped one, a smaller crescent-shaped one in front. And again, these things are really big. Each one, again, about the size of a car tire. And so after a few minutes, it dawned on us that, wait a minute, this was actually a great day. <laughs> we had found what we had come to find. We had found fossils, but just not bones or teeth or skeletons. These are trace fossils. They are footprints and handprints, but so much bigger than those ones in Poland because we're now in the Jurassic period. Dinosaurs are getting bigger. They're becoming dominant. And there's really only one type of dinosaur. Uh, in fact, only one type of animal that's ever lived on the land in the entire history of the Earth that was so big that every time its hand or foot hit the ground, it left a hole the size of a car tire. And that's these types of dinosaurs, the ones with the long necks, what we call the sauropod dinosaurs, the ones like Brontosaurus and Diplodocus. Now, later on in the Cretaceous period, the time after the Jurassic, some of these sauropods would become the very biggest animals ever to live on land. Some of them became literally bigger than Boeing 737 airplanes. So remember that the next time if you're on like a Southwest flight or something like that. There were dinosaurs that had to hatch from eggs that grew into larger sizes than that plane you're on. Now, these ones in the Jurassic period were merely about the size of three elephants put together. 
<laughs> but they were some of the first ones becoming really big. So we see this in Scotland, dinosaurs becoming huge. And now, the more we look, the more footprints we find. And one of my students, Paige, she, like me, is from America. She's from Nevada. Uh, and she moved out to Scotland to study with us. Paige has a background in geology, but also in engineering. So she's very good at building different gadgets and contraptions. And she's become an ace at using drones to fly over these rocks on the Isle of Skye. And she's identified lots of different track sites of lots of different dinosaurs. It's not only the long-necked dinosaurs. We have footprints and, uh, of meat-eating dinosaurs, of stegosaurs, the ones with the plates on their backs. We have duck-billed dinosaurs. We have a whole ecosystem of dinosaurs that was living, flourishing in Scotland 170 million years ago in the shallow lagoons and on the beaches back then. And this is a rendering from an artist, a good friend of ours, a guy named John Hode, who's from uh, Perth in Scotland, the little Perth, not the big one in Australia. Uh, and John is, he's great, he's a great artist. I am not, I'm lucky that I work with some great artists. Uh, and John has envisioned this scene where there's been a big storm in one of these lagoons, and the storm is breaking, and these big dinosaurs are going out to start eating some of the hundreds of pounds of leaves and plants they would need every day to fuel their giant bodies. But in the foreground, you can see there's something else lurking, something that only walks on two legs, something that has sharp teeth and claws. And these are what we call theropod dinosaurs, and that's just the fancy scientific name for the meat eaters, the group that includes T-Rex and Velociraptor, and also something feathery, which we'll see in a minute. Now, these things that were leaving their footprints alongside the giant long-necked dinosaurs in the Scottish lagoons were actually some of the very oldest tyrannosaurs. They were the ancestors of T. rex. They lived about 100 million years before T. rex, and they were merely the size of a human. So again, as we saw with dinosaurs themselves back in the Triassic period on the supercontinent, they started small and humble. It took them a long time to become big. It was the same with the tyrannosaurs. And so you might ask, how did tyrannosaurs supersize themselves? How did they become these ferocious top predators that are so famous, that are the stars of the movies? Well. We've learned quite a bit about this from a new fossil that was found a few years back in another place you might not think of when you think of dinosaurs. And this is Uzbekistan in Central Asia. And some colleagues of mine found the bones of a tyrannosaur that's an intermediate one. It's kind of in between the very oldest tyrannosaurs that were the size of humans that lived in the Jurassic and the very last tyrannosaurs like T-Rex, which were the size of buses that lived at the end of the Cretaceous. And this is a new species that is about the size of a horse. So again, kind of in between size. And we called it Timurlengia. We named it after the, one of the great warlords of Central Asia. Fitting name, I think, for a tyrannosaur. Mm -hmm. Now, what's important about this, and I promise you there's a reason why I have this, this kind of formless blob of something up on the screen there. What you're looking at there is the back end of this tyrannosaur's skull. And that hole is where the spinal cord goes in to the brain. Now, what's important about this is we can put that into a CAT scanner and use the x-rays of the CAT scanner to see inside, just like a medical doctor might use a CAT scanner to see inside of our bodies. And we can use software to make digital models of the stuff inside the head, the brain, the inner ear, the nerves, the blood vessels, the sinuses, all that stuff. That gives us insight into the actual biology and behavior of these animals. And what we're able to do is actually reconstruct what the brain of a tyrannosaur looks like. And this brain, that blue thing, that's the back end of this tyrannosaur's brain. That thing that looks like a pretzel there, that's the inner ear. And the thing that's hanging down from the pretzel, that's the cochlea. That's the thing in our ear is all coiled up. But that's the bit of the ear that really senses sound. Now, what's important here is that this tyrannosaur, again, it's just about the size of a horse. It's not a big top of the food chain animal. It's not a dominant animal, not yet. But it has a brain that is really big for a horse-sized reptile. And that cochlea is really long, the thing sticking down from the pretzel. We know from modern animals, the longer the cochlea, the greater range of sounds you can hear. That means that these tyrannosaurs were evolving bigger brains, higher intelligence, keener senses, while they were still quite small. 
and living in the shadows of other types of dinosaurs. Maybe as a way to survive. There were other giant meat eaters that were alive when this tyrannosaur was trying to eke out its existence, but it was evolving keener senses and higher intelligence. Now, some of those other big meat-eating dinosaurs died out in the middle part of the Cretaceous. And this is another big mystery. We don't know why. There's very few fossils of that age. But what we do know is that there was an extinction, there was some climate change, there were changes in the sea levels that wiped out a lot of the incumbent dinosaurs. And it left an opening at the top of the food chain, a job opening at the top of the food chain. These smaller tyrannosaurs were able to survive that extinction, maybe because they were intelligent and had good senses. We don't know. But they were able to survive, and then that apex predator role was open, and tyrannosaurs rushed in and filled the gap, and that's when tyrannosaurs supersized their bodies to become the bus-sized monsters that crushed the bones of their prey, with heads the size of bathtubs that I could fit inside of. And T. rex... Absolutely, the ultimate dinosaur predator. But what made T. rex so awesome was not just that it was big. It didn't just have bronze, but it also had brains. It inherited those bigger brains, keener senses from its ancestors. So it was its brute strength and its intelligence that made T. rex the king and the queen of dinosaurs. And that's why T-Rex is my favorite dinosaur. I know a lot of people say that, but that's true of me too. I know it's cliched, but it is my favorite dinosaur. Now, okay, tyrannosaurs got bigger over time, but there was another group of meat-eating dinosaurs that did the opposite. They got smaller over time, and these were the raptor dinosaurs. And what you're looking at here is the real velociraptor. Don't believe what you see in the movies. And I'm sorry, I only worked on the sixth film. By that point in the franchise, there was little I can do. But the real Velociraptor was only the size of a miniature poodle. And it was covered in feathers. And it even had wings. And that's not guesswork. That's not the hallucination of a mad artist. That's reality. We know this from actual fossils. We know that a lot of dinosaurs had feathers. And the great thing I took pride in was helping finally get feathers on some of the dinosaurs in Jurassic World Dominion. For those of you that saw it last summer, there's a new dinosaur in that film called Pyroraptor. And that one is covered with feathers. It has wings. That's what raptors really looked like. Again, this isn't some crazy hypothesis. This is reality. We know it from real fossils because... In 1996, in northeastern China, a place called Liaoning Province, this land of rolling hills, farmland, factories, far off the tourist trail, it shares a long border with North Korea. In 1996, three years after Jurassic Park came out, some farmers working their fields started to notice some really peculiar things in the rocks. They started to find the skeletons of dinosaurs covered in feathers. Some of them even had wings. So what dumb luck, right? Three years after the film comes out, if Spielberg tried to put feathers on those dinosaurs, he would have been laughed, well, maybe not laughed out of Hollywood, he would have been laughed at. Um, three years later, they found the feathers. And that's why it took until now to get feathers in some of the Jurassic Park dinosaurs. Anyway, this is something we know. There are now thousands of fossils of feather-covered dinosaurs that have been found in China because this part of China, back in the Cretaceous period, about 125 million years ago, it had the great misfortune of being this lush ecosystem with volcanoes in the distance, and occasionally those volcanoes would erupt and bury these entire ecosystems, almost like Vesuvius burying Pompeii. So it locked into stone all of these fossils with exquisite detail. I've been really privileged to work with some great Chinese colleagues to study some of these fossils. They are by far the most important dinosaur fossils found in my lifetime. First of all, they were the fossils that proved once and for all that today's birds evolved from dinosaurs. This theory goes all the way back to the time of Darwin, but finding feathers on dinosaurs, that was the final bit of evidence that the skeptics needed to be converted. So, we know that birds evolved from dinosaurs, but in addition to that, these fossils tell us how birds evolved from dinosaurs. How did evolution take a big, scary, meat-eating dinosaur and turn it into a small, feathered thing that could flap its wings and fly? Well, 
These fossils tell us, first of all, that most dinosaurs had feathers. This is part of the tail of a tyrannosaur, and those things that look like scratches in the rock above the bones, those are feathers. But very simple feathers. They would have been a lot like our hair, just little strands. And meat-eating dinosaurs have them. There are plant-eating dinosaurs from China that have them. There are small dinosaurs. There are dinosaurs that weighed more than a ton that have been found covered in these feathers. So this tells us that feathers were a normal thing for dinosaurs, the same way hair is a normal thing for mammals. But these dinosaurs could not have used their feathers to fly any more than we can use our hair. So feathers must have evolved for something else. And we think they probably evolved to help these dinosaurs control their body temperatures as part of their metabolism to stay warm. And most dinosaurs kept those very simple feathers. But one group of dinosaurs elaborated those feathers, and these were the raptor dinosaurs. And as those raptors were getting smaller and smaller over time, those feathers became ever more densely packed along their bodies. And some of these raptors started to line up some of these feathers on their arms. And those feathers got longer, and they started to branch out. They turned from things that looked like hairs into things that looked like brushes. And some of them even developed wings, proper wings. And that's what you're looking at here, a fossil wing. All of these feathers, quill pen feathers, flattened branching feathers, attaching to the, the arm, to the hand, just like in a bird today. But this is not a bird. This is a raptor dinosaur, and we don't call it a bird because its body was too big and its wings were too small that if it flapped those wings, it could not power itself through the air. That's really the convention of what makes a bird a bird. So the first wings actually show up in dinosaur fossils that are about the size of horses. Those wings are about the size of a laptop screen. No way even the first wings could be used for flying. And we think they probably evolved for display reasons like why a peacock uses his tail. It doesn't use that tail to fly, it uses it to attract mates, to intimidate rivals. And we can even tell the colors of dinosaur feathers. We can see the pigment in them under high power microscopes, and we can see that these feathers had all kinds of gaudy colors and patterns. So it was this raptor dinosaur that had that wing that I just showed you, and this is a, a beautiful fossil, one of the, the most amazing fossils I've ever had the great luck to study a new species that I was invited to help uh, describe with Jun Chong Lu, great, one of China's great dinosaur hunters there. And you can see these chocolate brown bones in this chalky limestone. The whole skeleton is there, and there's feathers all over the bodies. There's wings on the, uh, on the arm. Now, if you saw this dinosaur alive, it probably would have looked something like this. And if we, if we were around back in the Cretaceous period or one of these things was you know, brought to today, I'm pretty sure we would just consider it some type of bird. Okay, I mean, a really horrifying, terrifying monster bird, yes, with claws and sharp teeth. But really, is it any weirder than an ostrich or an emu? I don't know. But we, again, we don't call it a bird by convention because its body was too big, its wings were too small, it couldn't flap those wings to power itself through the air. But you can imagine, remember, these raptor dinosaurs were shrinking over time. You can imagine that they reached a point where the bodies were small, the wings were big, you know, they were elaborated to be better display structures, to attract mates better, advertising billboards, getting bigger and bigger, sticking off of the arms, that at some point the laws of physics would just take over. And if these little raptors started to move those arms, those advertising billboards would provide a little bit of lift, a little bit of thrust, and these dinosaurs could start maneuvering in the air. And it's at that point that we say birds were born. And as you can see, really, in that sense, flight essentially evolved by accident. That is how evolution works. It can't plan ahead. So the first dinosaurs to evolve feathers, to evolve wings, they would have never known that some descendants in the future would turn those things into flying structures in the same way that whoever invented the propeller, the wheel, would have never known that the Wright brothers would have put them eventually together into an airplane. So that means that dinosaurs live on today. And birds are dinosaurs, right? They evolved from other dinosaurs. They are part of the dinosaur family tree. They are as much dinosaurs as a T. rex is, as a brontosaurus is. And I know that's weird to think about, but you should really think about it the same way we think about bats. You know, what's a bat? A bats are mammals. Of course they are, right? They have hair, they feed their babies milk, they have all the things that make mammals mammals. They evolve from other mammals. They're part of the mammal family tree. 
They're just a strange type of mammal that got small, evolved wings, and developed the ability to fly. And that's what birds are, the dinosaur equivalent of that, a strange type of dinosaur that evolved wings and developed the ability to fly. And that means that there are actually over 10,000 species of dinosaurs still with us, more than double the number of mammals. And some of them majestic creatures like our presidential bald eagle here, uh, and others, ooh, not so much. <laughs> I live just a few miles from the North Sea in Edinburgh. We have so many gulls. They land on our roof. They're, whenever we're at the beach, they're always dive bombing us, trying to get our chips, our french fries, our ice cream. Uh, I think, if that's ever happened to you, in that moment, you can sense the, the nastiness, the viciousness, the cunning, the ferocity. You can sense the inner velociraptor in a seagull. <laughs> And that's not just a turn of phrase. It's a good turn of phrase, but it's not just one, because really, seagulls are dinosaurs. Velociraptor is one of their closest cousins. So dinosaurs live on, but only in the guise of birds. So imagine a world where all mammals went extinct except for bats. That's kind of the world we're in now. Because at the end of the Cretaceous period, something happened. Now, by that point, the world was starting to look more modern. The continents were moving around. And it was one day, one Tuesday evening, let's say, when that world was rudely interrupted by a six-mile-wide rock that was hurtling through space. It was traveling like 10 times faster than a speeding bullet. And it could have gone anywhere, right? It's just a piece of space junk. It could have gone anywhere, but it made a beeline for the Earth, and it smashed into what is now Mexico with the force of over one billion nuclear bombs put together, and it punched a hole in the Earth over 150 miles wide. And you can still see some of that crater in Mexico. The dinosaurs were there, T-Rex, Triceratops, they were there thriving the day that asteroid hit. And this asteroid unleashed chaos. Wildfires, tsunamis, earthquakes, all the dust and dirt and grime went into the atmosphere. It blocked out the sun for many years. Plants couldn't photosynthesize. They couldn't make their own food. The forests collapsed. The plant eaters had no food to eat. They died. The meat eaters had no food to eat. They died. Ecosystems just imploded like houses of cards. And the dinosaurs did not make it, and in fact, except for birds. And in fact, 75% of all creatures died out in what was the most recent mass extinction. And so, as I continue to study dinosaurs, I, and I, I've just become more interested in what happened after the asteroid. And so I've done a lot of work in New Mexico, out in the Badlands. Now this does look more like what you see on TV of people digging up dinosaurs. And I take my students out there because this is one of the best places in the world to find fossils of the very last dinosaurs. And then the animals that took over from them, the ones that survived. And we go out every year. I was there uh, in, in early June looking for fossils. I work closely with the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science. Tom Williamson, my dear colleague, who's the curator there. We bring our students out. This was Sarah. She was my very first PhD student. She's now one of the world experts on those animals that took over from the dinosaurs. And it's really amazing. You can walk these rocks in New Mexico, walk up through the rocks. There are so many dinosaur bones, you cannot help but step on the busted shards of T-Rex femurs and Triceratops backbones. And then they just disappear. And things go quiet in the rocks. And then these types of things start to appear. New fossils, fossils that maybe look familiar to you because at least most of us will have some of these in our mouths right now. These are teeth. And these are the classic teeth of mammals, molar teeth, premolar teeth, with all the ridges and valleys and cusps and so on. So it's mammals that survived the extinction. It's mammals that took over from the dinosaurs. And just a few million years after the asteroid, in the rocks of New Mexico, we start to find a lot of fossils of this mammal, an awkward, gangly thing, long arms and legs, just about the size of a house cat. A mm, little bit of poetry there. But long fingers and toes for grabbing onto the branches. And what you're looking at here is one of the very first primates, an ancestor of ours, an animal that only got its opportunity because that asteroid knocked out all of the dinosaurs except for birds. And I think that just goes to show how interconnected all of this is, our story and the story of the dinosaurs too. 
Now, there's a lot more I could say about mammals. There's a book about it, too, <laughs> that uh, some of you might be interested in learning the whole story of mammals, or I can come back sometime and tell you the story of mammals when there's a mammal fossil exhibit at the Clinton Center. Uh, but the point here really is that our story, our evolution, our existence, it does owe itself to that extinction. And the story of the dinosaurs really is our story, too. And I think, of course, there's lessons there, lessons about extinction, about climate change, about how the world can suddenly change, and how even the most dominant species sometimes can find themselves on the losing end if things change very quickly. So I think there's a lot to learn about dinosaurs, but I will leave it there as we've reached the top of the hour. And I'm very happy to take questions now. I know we're on a bit of a, a, a time, um, a, a uh, bit of a time uh, schedule here that Bridget is keeping us to, but we'll take as many questions as we can now. If you don't have a chance to have your question uh, answered, I'll be outside signing the books, and I'm happy to answer any questions out there. So again, thank you, everybody, for making this happen. It's very special. All right, now, I'm not sure if we have a microphone or, okay. Oh, well, okay. I'll go over here uh, first, yep, and then we can kind of go side to side. I need a microphone because I'm deaf. So, uh, thank you. So I appreciate your talk, your presentation. It was very fascinating. And I have another question in relation to that. Do you have to get a permit to look for fossils? And um, what, what happens to the fossils? Do mm -hmm. we leave them there? Or like, for example, in Scotland, do you mm -hmm. have to get one? Do you have to leave them there on site? Or? Yeah, oh, that's a great question, and especially one you know, befitting of a presidential library, and especially because President Clinton, another connection with dinosaurs, and there is, this is mentioned in the exhibits here, one of the, uh, the many great things that he did as president was sign uh, into law protecting an area called the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument uh, in Utah, which is full of dinosaur bones. He, he conserved that area by proclamation. Uh, that means that area is protected. That means that you do need a permit to collect there, and so the Bureau of Land Management uh, in the U.S. will control those permits, and they'll only grant them to scientists from universities or museums that can show that they that their experience um, and that they have a plan in place for what will happen to the fossils after they're collected. Um, if it's on private land in America, you can do what you want. Uh, and so if you ever see a dinosaur up for auction, this hits the news a lot these days, usually that's something that's collected on somebody's private ranch, and that's fine. But every country then has its own laws, and so what's true in America won't necessarily be true in Scotland. In Scotland, we have to get permits. A lot of the land is owned by the crown, so it used to be the queen, now the king. So we have to uh, get permission uh, in a similar way to how we would get permission in America. But some other countries, there's hardly any laws. And fossils are often ransacked, and it's, it's kind of a Wild West situation. So anyway, as, as, as academic paleontologists, we always have to be familiar with the laws and follow the laws, which we are very careful to do. All right, I'll take one from this side. Yeah, let me go over there. Yep. Hi, so we know that pteranodons are not dinosaurs, but I often see Quetzalcoatlus depicted as having feathers. Yeah. Is there any fossil uh, evidence of pteranodons also having these sort of primitive fur-like feathers? That's a great question. So yes, there is now. And that evidence has emerged over the last few years. There have been fossils of these pterodactyls from China, from those same rocks where these volcanoes buried a bunch of stuff, uh, and, those, and, and it locked in the soft tissues, and there are these little branching filaments on the pterodactyl skeletons. Now, they did not make up the wing. The wing of a pterodactyl is a wing made up of skin, kind of like a bat's wing. Uh, but these feathers were on the body, probably to help keep the animals warm. Uh, they look just like the feathers of like that Tyrannosaur I showed. So probably what that means is that feathers go back even farther in evolution, and the common ancestor of dinosaurs and pterodactyls would have had feathers. And we just didn't know it because it's so hard to preserve something as delicate as a feather unless something as random as a Pompeii-style volcanic event buries stuff. All right, we'll go over here. Yeah, you can 
right here. Thank you. You mentioned that the dinosaur morphs resemble dinosaurs. Well, what are the physical characteristics that define this is a dinosaur, this is another archaeosaur? Uh, well, there's a reason I didn't do it in the talk. I do this, I, I do it in my undergrad lectures, and even there, it kind of starts to bore the students because, believe it or not, it's only a few features of the anatomy, really nuanced things that define a dinosaur, that things like those dinosauromorphs don't have. And these are things like there's an opening in the pelvis, like the, jo the joint where the femur, the thigh bone goes into the pelvis. In us, it's a cup, you know? Um, and if somebody breaks their hip, a lot of times that head of the thigh bone kind of breaks off in the cup. In dinosaurs, it's an open hole, not a cup. Uh, dinosaurs have an extra backbone connecting to their hips to help stabilize the limbs. And true dinosaurs have a long um, uh, ridge on their upper arm bone, the humerus bone, for a big muscle that helps kind of bring the arm in. Those are the three technical features of the anatomy that technically distinguish dinosaurs from their very closest dinosaur morph cousins. So I will quiz you all later. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll go over here somewhere, yeah. There. Um, first a comment, I think Jurassic Park 6 was the worst one. <laughs> Get out! <laughs> but uh, really, go, going about... back to Jurassic Park 3, uh, the, uh, the male uh, scientist had, had made a big deal about how smart the velociraptors mm -hmm. were. Yeah. Do you think they were like smarter than the average bear? Yes, I think they were. And I'll still answer your question despite those harsh words about my film. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they were. So people have done and put uh, velociraptor skulls in the CAT scanner and they've done the thing building a digital model of the brains. And the brains of velociraptors are really big. For, for an animal about this size, the brains are, I don't know, something like, like this. Um, they're probably on the order of intelligence of some birds today, maybe even some mammals too. So they're quite smart. Probably the smartest dinosaurs, even smarter than tyrannosaurs. Again, that's based on the size of the brain relative to the body. It's not an exact measure of intelligence. I know there's, you know, neuroscientists in the room here that, that would scold me for this, but. Nope. All right, we'll go, ah, yes, there you go, in the blue. have tiny stub hands. Oh. So the question is why uh, T. Rex has had these tiny little arms. So um, there's a lot of ideas about it. We, we have a new study. We're trying to get it published. Um, for those of you that are, that are scientists, you'll appreciate it. We submitted it to the journal Nature. It's gone through some rounds of review, and they just rejected it because <laughs> we couldn't convince one of the reviewers. So we're, we're, we're trying to do the next steps on this. But we think we have an answer. We think that actually those small arms, they, the arms weren't just useless. The, the, so T-Rex was the size of a bus. Its arms were like the size of our arms, which is goofy, right? Like, you know, I mean, if you see a T-Rex, the arms look ridiculous. And imagine putting human-sized arms at the front of a bus, you know, how stupid that would look. Um, but they're still there. Evolution will lose things if they're doing nothing. Also, they're very muscular. They're much more muscular than our arms. And the muscles that are really big are the muscles that kind of bring the arms towards the body. Not only that, we can see throughout Tyrannosaur evolution that as the bodies get bigger and the heads get bigger, the arms kind of get smaller. So what we think is happening is that over the course of evolution, the head is taking over most of the responsibility for hunting, for getting food, actually grabbing the food, and then killing the, <laughs> the food and, and eating the food and so on. The arms, which in the primitive ancestors would have been used to grab prey, they shorten up because the head's now taking over that job, but the arms take on a new function which is helping to stabilize the T-Rex the as it's feeding. Because its head was so big, it bit so strong, that it would need to brace itself. And so we think that that is one of the reasons. And there could have been other reasons. But basically, those arms would, were not worthless. They were not useless. They were very good at holding stuff like this, grabbing on to things. So that's what we think. We will see now as we resubmit our study to a new journal. 
uh, what the new reviewers think, but uh, yeah, the scientists in the room, we had a problem with reviewer three, as they say, and <laughs> what can you do? <laughs> All right, let's see, we'll go over here. Yeah, you there, the plaid? So you basically always talk about how the, um, like how the natural deaths of dinosaurs. What about the dinosaurs that killed the other dinosaurs? Would the bones be like dis disrupted and stuff? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. So yes, you know, sometimes we find bones of dinosaurs that were probably killed by other dinosaurs. Uh, and the way we know that uh, is because there's bite marks on those bones. So you see the big wounds in the bones. And y if the bite marks are preserved well enough, uh, you can match them to the teeth, kind of like what the police, you know, and forensic people used to do with, you know, with, with crimes. I know it's not so much of an exact forensic thing anymore, but you can basically match the, the bite to the teeth. And so there are bones of triceratops, of duck-billed dinosaurs with big bite marks that perfectly match the teeth of T-Rex. And so sometimes those bite marks show signs of healing, that the bone is grown around them. That means that that animal must have survived the attack to live on. But other times, those bite marks show no signs of healing, which maybe means that the T-Rex in that case killed that dinosaur, or maybe it scavenged the kind of way that we can see what ate what. And you're right, if, if a dinosaur has been eaten by another dinosaur, it's not going to be a beautiful skeleton like these ones that were buried by the volcano. There'll be bits and pieces and chunks and like, a, you know, a, a, some kind of smashed vase or something like that. That's what it'll look like. All right, we've got, yeah, down here in front. You can shout it out and I'll repeat it. That's fine. What's the largest fossil that you found and what dinosaur did it come from? The largest one. Well, those footprints of those long necked dinosaurs in Scotland, um, although it's not the skeleton of those dinosaurs, those dinosaurs would have been, you know, the size of three elephants. When I first was, got, a start, got started as a student, in college, I was on some dinosaur digs, and that's where I learned to dig dinosaurs. Um, and we were digging up some, some long-necked dinosaurs that were the size of like four or five elephants put together. From, these are from the Jurassic period in Wyoming. Uh, so those are probably the biggest ones that, that I've worked on. Yeah, we'll go over here. Yeah, in the back there, we got another two. Yeah, yep. Now we'll get yours. We'll get yours actually afterwards. In the How many aqua dinosaurs were there? How many, like water dinosaurs? Ah, so, okay. This is a good question. There's all these reptiles that lived back in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous that, that lived in the water. Things like mosasaurs and plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs. Um, and, and their fossils are amazing. Um, they're not dinosaurs. They're other types of reptiles that are cousins of dinosaurs, kind of like pterodactyls. Not true dinosaurs, they're cousins of dinosaurs. There are some water-living dinosaurs today, penguins and those kind of things. Um, but as far as during like the Jurassic and the Cretaceous, and the Triassic as well, uh, there were no dinosaurs that we know of that completely lived in the water. There was no like whale version of a dinosaur or dolphin version of a dinosaur. It's one of the few things dinosaurs never did. And that's another big mystery. We don't know why. You know, some dinosaurs, some got to be bigger than jet airplanes. Some became tiny and started to fly. Why could they not go into the water? We don't know. But maybe it's just because these other reptiles were already there and there was no space for dinosaurs to go in the water. We don't know, but that's another, to me, that's another one of the big mysteries about dinosaurs. Uh, we had another one in the blue shirt, just uh, two behind there. Go. Hmm. How much pressure was in, uh, in a T-Rex bite? Uh, I, you know, I can't remember the exact number. It's in the book, I think. You'll have to read the book. Uh, but there's a lot. So T-Rex probably had basically like the strongest bite of anything we know of. Some sharks have really powerful bites, but it was something like the force of, of, of like a Ford, you know, F-150 pickup truck, like on each side of the jaw, something like that. Um, and it's crazy. I mean, it, you know, it was powerful enough to snap bone. So some of these bite marks that I mentioned here, there's actually bones of prey species that have been 
completely smashed up by the teeth of T-Rex. Now, were any of you here for Karen Chin's talk? Yes. So Karen Chin, I've been Karen for a long time. She's the world expert, as some of you know, on dinosaur poop. And uh, they're called coprolites. You know, actually, there's a lot of fossils, and they tell us a lot. Of, they're very important. They help tell us what ate what and how the, what the food webs were like. But she described, about 25 years ago now, one of the most amazing fossils ever. It got into nature. It wasn't rejected by Reviewer 3. And the title of the paper was A King-Sized Coprolite. It was a piece of poo from a T-Rex. It was over a foot long. And it was chock full of bone, of the actual bone that the T-Rex shattered. So it bit so hard that it shattered the bones of its prey. And again, I can't remember the numbers, but it's something on the order of like the pressure of a big pickup truck. Was that five you're saying? Okay, we have time for a few more questions. We'll go over here. And then again, anybody who wants a book, I'll sign it. And then of course, any questions you want as we're signing books, I'm very happy to take them. Yeah, let's go in the back there. And let's do bo both, both of you have your hands up. We'll just do both of those. So I have the little one first. Giving it to me or him? Why did dinosaurs get so big? Oh, oh, that's such a hard question. But such a, a kind of basic question, right? Like what was able to, what permitted these dinosaurs to get so big? Now the biggest um, animals that have ever lived are not dinosaurs, they're whales. Like blue whales are the biggest animals that have ever lived and they live right now, which I think is really cool. But they live in the water, and in the water, the buoyancy of the water can support an animal. You don't have to walk around. You don't have to hoist yourself up against gravity in the same way. So land animals are never going to be as big as the biggest water animals. And as far as land animals go, dinosaurs are the heavyweight champions. And the biggest mammals that ever lived on land probably weighed about 18 or 20 tons, which is big. That's like three or four elephants put together. But the biggest dinosaurs that ever lived on land were probably like 80 tons. So why were they able to get so much bigger than mammals? We don't have a firm answer, but we think there's a couple of things that are important. One of them is they had the big long neck so they could reach high into the trees. They could access basically an all-you-can-eat buffet of food that no other animals could reach. So that helped them power their, their bodies. The other thing is, they had very good lungs. And what I mean by that, I mean their lungs could take in a lot more oxygen than our lungs. And why is that important? Because the more oxygen you can take in, the bigger you can grow. Now, how do we know that? We don't find fossil lungs, but the lungs of birds today have these balloons that stick out from them. They're called air sacs. And they actually store extra air that allows birds to take in more oxygen. Those air sacs go into the bone. They leave marks on the bone. We see those same marks on the fossils of dinosaurs. So we know that a lot of dinosaurs had the same type of really efficient lungs as birds. So probably a combination of the necks reaching a lot of food, the lungs taking in more oxygen helped the dinosaurs get to be really big, at least bigger than mammals. But again, it's still a bit of a mystery. So I think a lot more work needs to be done on that. All right, we had one more there, which we'll do. You've made a lot of references to millions of years, mm -hmm. periods of time. Yep. My question is, how has the scientific community figured out how to measure mm -hmm. such huge amounts of time to make any sense? Yes, so we know quite a bit about uh, the age of the Earth and the age of different rocks because some rocks actually preserve a chemical fingerprint of time inside of the rocks. And what happens is, um, it's all about radioactive decay. So certain elements will break down into other elements over time, releasing radiation. This is what Marie Curie discovered. And so for instance, uh, uranium, you start with some uranium, over time it will turn into lead and it releases radiations that does so. Now, it doesn't do so all at once. It does it kind of in a bit-by-bit, a -bit piecemeal way. And we know from lab experiments the rate at which that happens, at which uranium turns into lead. Now, with rocks, if a rock has formed from 
a magma or a lava, something that's liquid that then solidifies into a rock. At the moment that rock turns into a solid, that uranium will start breaking down into lead. So you can measure the uranium, you can measure the lead, you know the rate at which it changes from the lab, you can then back calculate to determine the age of the rock. And so that's how we know the ages of a lot of rocks. It doesn't work for all rocks. And there's very specialist geologists that, um, that focus on this, but it's a technique called radiometric dating. Carbon dating is kind of similar. Maybe you heard of carbon dating, but carbon dating only works on things that are a few tens of thousands of years old because the carbon all breaks down really quickly. But carbon dating is used to date like archeological artifacts, but it's the same principle. All right, I think we have time for one more and then we'll do the book. So right here with the bow. And again, I promise any other questions, I will answer them, just not publicly. <laughs> yeah, there we go. All right. Are Quetzalcoatlus the biggest pterosaurs that lived when the dinosaurs lived? Ah, oh, Quetzalcoatlus. Great, and you mentioned Quetzalcoatlus as well. This is a pterodactyl or a pterosaur that was found uh, in Texas about 50 years ago. And it's been found in a few other places. Um, it, it was the size of a fighter jet plane. Its wingspan was like 30 feet, something like that. And as far as we know, it was the biggest or, or the second biggest pterodactyl that ever lived with dinosaurs. And that would make it the biggest or second biggest thing that's ever flown in the history of the Earth. The only thing that may rival it is one from Europe. Uh, it's called Hatsigopteryx. It's from Romania, the country of Romania. And I've done a lot of field work in Romania. And if, about 10 years ago, we were collecting bones. And we found a bone unlike anything we'd ever seen before. Like seriously, I mean, I've studied anatomy my whole life like a medical doctor. I learned the bones. My students learned the bones. We learned the names of the bones, how to recognize them, all the different bumps on all the bones, where all the muscles attach, all that stuff. That's what we learned. But I'd never seen a bone like this. Nobody on the field trip had ever seen a bone like this. It was about the size of a football. And it had no symmetry to it. It had holes in it. It had grooves in it. It had ridges on it. It had a big ball on one side of it. We had no idea what this bone was. And then we figured out a little bit later that this bone, the size of a football, was a single wrist bone of Hatsigopteryx. So our wrist bone is like the size of a pea. Its wrist bone was the size of a football. That shows how big that animal was. That's a great question to end on. So again, thank you all. A great privilege to, to speak to you all. And I will be out signing the books and answering any other questions you have. So thanks again. A very quick thank you once again to Dr. Bersotti. If we could give him one more round of applause, please. My name is Victoria Di Francesco Soto, and I'm the Dean of the Clinton School. Very proud sponsor of this program together with the Presidential Library and the Foundation. Um, I have learned that if there's someone who knows his book recs, it's President Clinton. Thank you for joining us tonight. And please join us for more conversation and book signing.